given by Hideo Mabuchi from Stanford University, and we, as you see, we see something about design and analysis of autonomous quantum memories. Please, Hideo. Thank you very much, Reiner. I uh, should certainly start by thanking the organizers of this workshop for the opportunity to be here and to give one of these uh, extra special keynote addresses. Uh, I hope you won't be terribly disappointed as this talk will include neither group theory nor filter functions, but uh, I'll try to say something else interesting instead. So uh, the topic, uh, as noted, is design and analysis of autonomous quantum memories based on coherent feedback control. And really the theme is just a, a kind of a case study on how one can take the key ideas about quantum error correction that come from the standard formalism of stabilizers and uh, you know, coding, unitary maps, all that kind of thing, but really push those ideas down to a physical level of modeling, which is maybe a little bit closer to the kinds of things that engineers and experimental physicists uh, would like to think about. And you know, earlier shop, we've heard uh, a lot of, about a lot of very elegant work on how to do that kind of push down of kind of taking these ideas and going down to the level of Hamiltonian interactions uh, from these lattice types of models, which one could maybe say are, uh, are uh, couched in a language which is more familiar to people working maybe on atomic optical lattices or even these days in condensed matter systems. And maybe you could think of the, the idea of this work uh, would be to do the same sort of thing, except to really connect those ideas to things that are a little bit closer to uh, current developments in experimental photonics and maybe some of those ideas can also be carried over into the world of circuit QED and, and microwave quantum information processing. So let me also acknowledge that the kind of precursors of this work were supported by ARO. Um, the current and continuing work is supported by the NSF. And if I have time at the end, uh, in terms of kind of contextualizing this work and connecting it to some other things that are going on, uh, I may make mention of some stuff which is supported by, uh, by DARPA. So uh, it, it's really the idea is to uh, get to a formulation of a quantum memory which is based on the usual ideas of coding and syndrome detection and, and re restorative feedback, but to really uh, learn how to do that in a system which is completely microscopically described. So uh, actually for the analogy, I like to resort to the microwave story of uh, you know, the superconducting circuits, your actual quantum dynamical stuff is down in the doer, maybe even you've got some preamplifiers down in the doer, but generally if we're talking about doing control or even uh, real-time feedback control, you've got signals that have to come in and out of the doer, they have to come back up to room temperature for the classical computation and they go back down. And uh, this is all a, a kind of a way to, uh, to short circuit that and just do all of the processing that's necessary for the feedback control for quantum error correction uh, down in the doer or in the photonics case to do everything really at nanoscale without requiring any um, classical control signals to come in and out of the quantum memory. And there are really three main uh, uh, ingredients to talk about in order to explain how that whole thing gets set up. First of all, I'll introduce some simple ideas about how to do syndrome detection in continuous time. Um, I think there, again, are various approaches to doing this kind of thing. I'll explain the one which kind of feels most natural from a quantum optics point of view. Uh, and I'll try to build a little in bit of intuition about how things like signal noise ratio in a continuous syndrome measurement uh, translates into the actual performance of an error correcting code. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the idea of uh, coherent feedback control and uh, the idea of doing the feedback without ever bringing the, the signals up to a, a classical uh, level. And then in order to actually construct an overall model of how the autonomous quantum memory is going to function, I'll just introduce a few ideas uh, from, from control theory uh, about what's called uh, SLH modeling of um, quantum optical input-output components and make some connections to, uh, to the to current things going on in control theory. And all of that will add up then to a sort of a relatively simple picture in the end of how this kind of uh, autonomous or embedded quantum record and controller is supposed to work, uh, but one which I think is uh, very satisfying for us. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that this is how one should go out and build uh, quantum memories, but I think the ideas that are demonstrated there uh, form a very nice, um, the, you know, provide kind of a lesson on how quantum information ideas can really be uh, brought into the, uh, the mainstream of what people are doing in nanophotonics. So, uh, you know, I mentioned this idea about trying to uh, take ideas from quantum error correction and push them down into the physical level of modeling in photonics. And as many of you know, um, photonics is something which is very seriously being pursued uh, not only in academic research groups but in industry. So this is just uh, to flash up a slide from our colleagues over at HP Labs, which is just across the street from St Stanford University. And they have a fairly serious investment in what they call large-scale integrated photonics. Uh, you know, photonics uh, on one end connects to very quantum mechanical things, so there's a lot of work being done these days on embedding quantum dots or nitrogen vacancy centers or other sorts of atom-like solid states 
into uh, nanophotonic lithographically defined resonators so that you could do kind of a solid state version of cavity QED. And that obviously uh, is highly analogous to the sorts of things that people have done in uh, single atom cavity QED, or things that people are doing in microwave circuit, Q cavity circuit QED. At the same time, I think uh, the investments that a company like HP is making in, in nanophotonics is actually not so much driven by the ultimate goal of quantum computing, but rather just by the realization that as you look at the future scaling of conventional uh, computer processors, so just sticking within the informational paradigm of classical information processing, there are uh, severe bottlenecks uh, looming not so far down the road, maybe five, ten uh, years down the road, about how to really bring down uh, heat dissipation and how to uh, solve kind of power bottlenecks, both in computing and even just in transporting information around on a chip. And it's thought that um, if you could learn to build uh, large-scale integrated photonic systems, this might be a good way to kind of hybrid computer chips that might still do their computation using CMOS transistors, but where maybe information is moved around in, in optical form. So there's a, a large industrial base being built up uh, for working with photonics as an in information processing uh, physical paradigm. You know, currently with a large focus on, on classical information processing, but as I'll try to argue through this talk, it's a very small step, I think, to generalize some of that to do quantum information processing. That was, a, I mean, if you really take it to uh, the limits of, of, uh, of integration, so this is a slide that I downloaded off of the web uh, from a current project running at IBM where they've become very serious about large-scale integration in silicon photonics. And so, you know, they can have these photographs like this of uh, large-scale wafers, and you zoom in and find that they're able to string together uh, large sequences of very uh, uh, complex sorts of components and really make things that look like circuits for light waves as opposed to circuits for electronic voltages and, and currents. So, uh, you know, to make contact to that world, uh, sort of introduce a friendly way to think about things like quantum error correction that very naturally maps onto that sort of developing fabrication technology, uh, to me, one of the key things that has to be done is to uh, take the view of quantum error correction, which has largely uh, arisen in the kind of thought paradigm of computer science and of digital signal processing, and really pull it back down to a, a kind of earlier, more primitive state of electrical engineering, which focused on analog components and, uh, and uh, in different kinds of circuit diagrams. Right, so at the very top of this page, I've written something which is, it's, it's a little bit weird, but you'll recognize the notation as being that of a, what we, at a, at a workshop like this, typically when people say quantum circuit, they mean something like what's drawn at the top. But if you, th if you think about what that diagram really is, uh, Dave Bacon in his talk yesterday just put the labels on that there's time going across the horizontal axis, and there's a kind of implicit one-dimensional space axis going across the top. So really, that thing is not so much a circuit diagram as uh, we might learn about in elementary electrical engineering courses in graduate school. It's really kind of a graphical pseudocode that specifies an algorithm for what's supposed to happen. Right? And contrast that to this diagram that's uh, drawn in the middle of the page, where this is, uh, you know, if you've done some electronics, this is very familiar to you. There is an operational amplifier with a resistive feedback network uh, providing negative feedback to turn this thing into an inverting amplifier. And there's a big difference in that, uh, although this uh, middle diagram is still something kind of schematic, right, the components are depicted in a cartoony sort of form, it nevertheless actually shows you uh, what physical devices are supposed to be uh, plugged into your circuit board, roughly where are they supposed to be in relation to one another, how are the outputs and inputs of these different components supposed to be connected. And the idea of this kind of thing is that if you actually make such a, a circuit layout, Right, so you make the operational amplifier and the two resistors or capacitors or whatever. If you put them in this, uh, uh, if you lay them out kind of like this, connect their inputs and outputs in, in this sort of a topology, once you've made that circuit, all your work is done. Right? The only thing that you need to do in order to have this little circuit actually function is you just have to power it. Right? And so that's, I think, the kind of paradigm which is uh, familiar from, from, uh, from classical electrical engineering. And the question that uh, we've been asking is, well, can you do a similar sort of thing to the idea of quantum error correction, uh, but now adapted to the kinds of devices and layouts that one can imagine in the maybe not too distant future in uh, the nanophotonics platform? So this uh, image that's at the bottom, something that I stole from my colleague, Yelena Vuchkovic, it's just an electron micrograph of a photonic crystal membrane. So this is the top view of a two-dimensional uh, uh, thin dielectric membrane. Uh, a series, an array of holes have been punched in it, so the little holes are the ones that are relevant, and kind of you, you pad around some little structures, so there's an obvious stripe that goes down the middle. That thing functions as a, as a waveguide for light, it's a wire. 
at the two ends. It's probably hard to see, but there's a, a after a little bit of a gap, there's another little kind of dot there, and that little dot uh, functions as an optical resonator. Uh, there's another one of them down at the other end, and so this is very simply a device where you have two input-output optical components connected by a wire. And so the, the kind of grand idea of this is to move towards a paradigm where uh, what we'd like to be able to do is to specify, at least in some schematic kind of way, analogous to the op-amp diagram in the middle of the slide, how to lay out nanophotonic components of a specifiable type such that you would uh, go into your e-beam fab and make a thing like this, which would be a nanophotonic circuit, which then just existed as a solid hunk of stuff. And in order to get that uh, circuit to perform continuous uh, quantum error correction, the only thing that you would need to do is to provide it power, right? So that it would be a lot more like this uh, circuit that's drawn in the middle of the slide and a lot less like the kind of uh, algorithmic step-by-step -step synchronous sort of thing uh, that's implied by the diagram that's written at the top. Um, so first, uh, let me kind of ease into this idea of going from discrete step-by-step -step pictures of quantum error correction into uh, how we would think about doing error correction in continuous time without running any, into any sorts of issues about quantum Zeno paradox or anything like that. Um, so uh, in almost all of the talk, I'm just going to be focusing on the simplest possible uh, quantum error correction code. So I'll just talk about the three qubit bit flip code. Nevertheless, all of the ideas that are presented here uh, generalize in a very straightforward way to uh, sta other sorts of stabilizer codes. And so I'll at least briefly show a diagram of a similar sort of circuit for doing a, a Bacon Shore version of the nine qubit uh, uh, code that, that corrects an arbitrary single qubit error. Um, so, uh, but just for the bit flip code, uh, you know, the only thing that you really need to be able to do is to make parity measurements on the Z parities of pairs of qubits in the register. Right, single logical qubit as the entangled state of three physical qubits in a register, logical zero represented <coughs> by zero, 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 logical one represented by one, one, one. And in order to read out uh, the syndrome of, of a possible error, what you want to do is uh, read out at least two different parities in that, uh, in that register. Right, so you might look at uh, Z1, Z2, and also look at Z1, Z3, or you could, you could choose any other pair like that. So in order to think about how one does that in a continuous way, as opposed to the usual kind of picture that would involve a controlled, controlled not gate and an ancilla, um, just consider the following idea, which um, is, you know, more or less follows from things that have previously been done in the literature. And there's some alternatives to this very idea, uh, one of which is uh, described by Ann Nielsen in a 2010 paper. But uh, suppose I have um, a coherent state of light, so single spatial mode, uh, coherent state, so at least in some approximation, this is the kind of light that just comes out of an ideal laser. So uh, the coherent is fully specified by a single complex number. That's the complex amplitude. The magnitude of that complex number tells me how much power is in that beam. And the phase of the complex number tells me the phase of the coherent state. And so the notation here will be just in a Dirac head. If I put the number alpha, that's the complex number that represents the, the complex uh, amplitude and phase of that coherent state. So um, in a certain scattering phase convention, if I just uh, take such light and I uh, reflect it off of an isolated mirror, right, so the, the laser beam comes in, reflects off the mirror, and that's it, well, I can choose a phase convention in which under that type of reflection, the phase of the coherent state is unchanged. Now under that same uh, phase convention, if I consider instead that I have two uh, ideal mirrors, and I place those mirrors face to face, and I make a little resonant cavity, then under the assumption that the frequency of this coherent state uh, is resonant uh, to the spacing between the mirrors, so roughly speaking, if the wavelength of the light fits an exact integer number in the distance between these two reflecting boundary conditions, then I'll be driving that cavity on resonance. If I assume that that's an empty cavity, and maybe it's a single-sided cavity, so that the light goes in and out one side of the cavity only, then under those same kind of scattering conventions, if I look at what happens to the phase of the uh, probe beam, then rather than bouncing off of the cavity and having no phase change, it actually suffers a high phase change. And so uh, in order to put a qubit into the story and talk about how this starts to be something like a sigma z measurement, uh, we can choose as the physical carrier of a qubit of information if we pick something like uh, a typical atomic level structure. So this little thing inside of the, that's drawn inside of the cavity, so here, uh, So if, we, uh, if this guy and that guy, if those are the two end mirrors of the cavity, I, my resonant probing beam is coming in this way. If I imagine that inside of that cavity I have this atom-like uh, object, which has maybe two stable ground states, 
and one uh, electronic excited state, I can imagine that the level spacing between this ground state and that excited state is resonant with the transition uh, frequency of the cavity, whereas the uh, energy between this lower ground state and the excited state is off resonance. So what that would mean is that if I have, and uh, the idea would be then to encode the qubit in the coherence uh, superposition of these two ground states. So uh, if the atom inside the cavity is prepared in this lower ground state, then uh, there, the transition that's accessible is not the one that's resonant to the cavity mode. So if the qubit is in this state, this probe beam comes by and drives the cavity, it still looks like an empty cavity, and so we would get this uh, pi phase change. On the other hand, if the atom happens to be in the other logical state, then uh, this uh, accessible transition is resonantly driven by light in the cavity. And uh, because of the uh, now familiar physical phenomenon of vacuum Rabi splitting, what happens in that case is the light is still perfectly reflected from the cavity, but if you work out all the details, rather than picking up a pi phase change, it again picks up a zero phase change. So what that says is that in terms of a single qubit like this, if we just take a coherent laser probe and bounce it off of a cavity, then depending on whether the embedded qubit is in a logical zero or a logical one, uh, this uh, coherent state will either pick up a pi phase shift or a zero phase shift. So now you get very easily the idea about how to do a parity measurement. So if I just have this same optical probe beam uh, reflect sequentially off of two different qubit cavity systems, right? so those two different qubits will be two of the qubits in the register. The cavities are there really just to enhance the coupling between the probe beam and the atoms. But the net effect will be that if the qubits are both in the down state, then the phase shifts picked up by the, uh, by the probe beam will be pi and pi. But of course, for an optical beam, a two pi phase shift is the same thing as a zero phase shift. Uh, if the two qubits are in the one one state, then I'll get phase shifts of zero and zero, so I'll get that zero phase shift. But if I have one zero or zero one, then one of the reflections will give me, the other will give me zero. And so overall, the phase shift of the probe beam will be pi. So you end up with, some, with something where now you've used this continuous probe beam to, uh, to, to determine the parity of the two qubits, and the result is encoded in the, out, the phase of the outgoing probe beam being either zero or pi. And you know, so of course, a, a kind of larger question in a lot of these businesses of, uh, of trying to create physical uh, realizations of the ideas of quantum error correction, especially if we try to engineer it at this very low level, that uh, all of this stuff that goes on in the stabilizer formalism, right? all of the non-trivial stabilizers are two-body operators that you're trying to measure. And sort of implicit in that is that, well, if we're going to do this measurement in some sort of indirect way, where there's either an, an ancilla qubit or a field like this, if you want to try to measure a two-body observable, then really the Hamiltonian that you're supposed to be using to make the coupling is always supposed to be a three-body Hamiltonian. But nature doesn't really give you any of those to work with, so you have to synthesize them somehow. And so, of course, you know, there are lots of tricks that have been invented on how to do that, but uh, you very quickly realize that, well, if I have a Hamiltonian, which is a two-body Hamiltonian, but then if I think about propagators, which are exponentials of those, if I can take those propagators and somehow pull out something nonlinear, that's really what I need to do in order to synthesize those three-body interactions. And here, we get to use a very simple sort of form of the nonlinearity, which is simply the fact that the, this kind of phase of a, of a coherent beam lives on a circle rather than on a line. Right, so that's what's giving us the nonlinearity that allows us to make something that really looks like a two-body parity measurement, uh, uh, you know, as opposed to something else. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, just to show that, okay, so uh, a thing that you can do uh, to analyze exactly what goes on, obviously, this is the simple picture, but you would really like to see how well does this kind of scheme perform under a, you know, a more exact kind of physical model. You could write down the James Cummings ha uh, interaction Hamiltonian between this embedded qubit and the cavity mode. You have some nice quantum optical input-output theory about how the probe beam really interacts with that whole thing. And I think that uh, using some recently developed uh, uh, kind of quantum optics theory is that in the limit uh, where both the uh, Rabi frequency that couples the qubit to the cavity and the cavity decay rate are both large, but where the ratio of those two things is fixed at, at some more or less arbitrary value, then uh, the, the input-output model for this kind of a scattering system goes over exactly into a sigma z measurement. And so that's the theme we're going to come back to a few more times in constructing the overall circuit model, which is that although we understand how to write down uh, explicit physical model for these things in terms of microscopic physics like the James Cummings model, um, it turns out that for the kinds of components that we've uh, designed, if you consider this limit where both the Rabi frequency and the uh, cavity decay rate 
when those both go to infinity uh, compared to other parameters, then the effective scattering models for all of these components will greatly simplify. And that's really the key to allowing us to construct an overall circuit model that this, uh, this quantum memory will work using an actual uh, continuous time differential equation uh, sort of model. And that particular limit, I think, is a very natural one for this nanophotonic setting. So you, 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 know, you get the idea that using e-beam lithography or other such techniques, you can make very, very small resonators uh, in the nanophotonics context. And so as you go to this small volume limit, the thing that very naturally emerges for cavity QED type models is that G gets very large and kappa gets very large. Right? So the vacuum Rybe frequency and the cavity decay rate naturally both get large at the same time in the small volume limit. And that's exactly the parameter limit that we want to consider uh, for the functional models of these sorts of devices that we want uh, in this basic business of designing uh, autonomous quantum memories. But just to confirm that this kind of thing can work reasonably well using, uh, say, currently accessible experimental parameters, if you just mock up in a quantum trajectory type of simulation, a situation like this where we've got atoms coupled to two cavities and we allow a laser beam to scatter off of them, uh, and then we do something to prepare a state for these two qubits, uh, which is factorizable. So we have uh, zero, one, uh, sorry, 0 plus 1 tensor 0 plus 1. So if that's our initial state, uh, but then we turn on this sort of continuous parity measurement, um, then what should happen after some time has gone by right, is that by detecting the phase of the outgoing beam, that should project either onto 0 or pi, which should then project out either the even or odd parity component of uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the initial factorizable state. So we should actually create an entanglement there. But there's a little bit of a question about how that dynamic should actually look in time. So here's an example of a, uh, of a quantum trajectory simulation which shows the projection of the uh, conditional state as a function of time onto either the uh, even or odd uh, parity component. And so they start out both at a half, but you see that they kind of wiggle around for a while before settling down. In this model, we've also got occasional bit flips so there's, an, a bit, there's a bit flip that occurs here in this uh, particular uh, simulation. So the parity measurement catches up and realizes that that's happened. But you see that uh, kind of by construction in this sort of a very physical model of the parity measurement, the measuring the parity of the two qubits takes an amount of time. Right? So there's a finite rate at which you actually get information. And it's very easy to see why that should be, right? because uh, you know, for those of you who are used to thinking about coherent states of, of light beams or, or harmonic oscillators, you know, the vacuum state uh, that's something which has uh, zero complex amplitude, but it's got a certain quantum uncertainty to it. And so now, if we talk about making a coherent state, that means that we displace that, uh, that uncertainty disk along some direction, and that would be maybe like the zero uh, phase version of, of the coherent state amplitude. If we give it a pi phase shift, that means we bring it over here. Right? But in order to really be able to distinguish those zero and pi phase states uh, very well, you actually need to separate their amplitude by quite a bit, because right? otherwise their uncertainties are overlapping. And in this sort of picture, what that just means is if the flux of photons coming from the lasers is finite, you have to, you know, it, it, when you've just turned that thing on and only like one photon through and scattering off of both of the cavities, you know, that single photon's worth of amplitude doesn't really distinguish those two states enough. But as more and more photons come through, then the sort of effective amplitude uh, pulls out. And so gradually over time, you're able to distinguish the fact that uh, the scattering phase shift overall is zero or pi. Right, so that kind of uh, the drawn out in time nature of this kind of a measurement is very naturally captured in the sort of a physical model. And so, uh, you know, just to, if you really want to relate all of this stuff back to what would this look like in the usual sort of uh, uh, quantum circuit setting, um, I think I've accurately drawn on the top there a sort of effective model for what's going on. <coughs> so it would still be the case that I've got, uh, you know, kind of uh, three register qubits, which are the three lines at the top. There'll be two ancilla qubits running along the bottom, representing the uh, outputs of the two different parity measurements that you need to make. Here, a 1-2 parity and a 1-3 parity. And uh, if you uh, use this kind of circuit where you had controlled, controlled knots, then obviously one iteration through this thing, you could uh, perfectly measure those parities that you want to measure. But if, on the other hand, you consider making those controlled, controlled knots, and you turn them into controlled, controlled rotations, where the rotation angle was something very small, but then you increase the frequency with which you do these things, Right, so you do a, a smaller and smaller conditional rotation angle, but you do more and more of these uh, measurements for unit time. That will take you over to this continuous uh, measurement limit. Right, so where just a single click in the, in the detectors that are looking at the ancilla qubits, a single click doesn't give you any definitive information about the parity if the conditional rotation angle is very small. But if I do this over and over again and do many of them, eventually I can add that up, kind of statistically average out the noise, and I can determine what the parities are. And so this optical version of this, where we're talking about phases or homodyne measurement or whatever, is a lot like this kind of a setup. 
where the, uh, the power of the probe beam and other things related to the strengths of the, you know, the vacuum rod, the frequencies and whatnot, those go into determining something like the product of the Kishin angle and the, and the frequency with which those measurements are made. Right? So there's a notion of information per unit time, which in the optical implementation has mostly to do with the strength of the probe beam. So, I mean, imagine if we really were trying to just do this in the usual error correcting sort of setup. So we would literally, uh, as, as suggested in this diagram back here, that uh, you know, we would allow this probe beam to bounce off of the, the cavities that contain the qubits. We would do our best uh, job of trying to measure the phase shift of the outgoing probe beam. And say we tried to take that noisy signal and do something with it and try to sort of use that to determine when a bit flip had occurred and then uh, went back in to perform some restorative action. What would that overall, how would that overall system perform? Well, let me introduce a, a kind of notation that we've used in some, some other publications on that, uh, on that topic where, uh, so in this kind of a setting, you can imagine that, well, what we're trying to do is estimate the error state of the code based on these sorts of continuous noisy measurements. <coughs> so initially, when your register has just been initialized in its logical state and, you know, at very short times where you're pretty sure no error has occurred, you can say that the state of the code is III in the sense that no error has occurred. And then if some time goes by, then there's increasing likelihood uh, that you may have uh, suffered a bit flip on at least one of the qubits. So you might have to consider the error states XII, IXI, IIX, right, in the obvious kind of uh, notation. Likewise, two errors would be represented by things like XXI, XIX, IIX. And eventually you might get to the, to the state where all of the bits have been flipped, that would be triple X. But of course, uh, you know, since these bit flips are happening as a random process, uh, kind of any of the transitions that are drawn by arrows are allowed. Right, so if I start from III, make a single bit flip, I go to IXI, then maybe the last qubit flips, I go up to IXX, and then I might go down to IIX if the middle bit flips again. Right, so the actual dynamics of the error state of the code is a random walk on this kind of a graph. And really you can view it as your job in an electrical engineering-y sort of way to say, all right, so I've got these two uh, noisy continuous time measurements of a pair of parities. So what I'm trying to do is to use that information to optimally reconstruct a posterior probability on this graph. Right, so at time t equals zero, I'm sure that my register is still in a perfect state, so I assign the probability vector that has value one on III and zero on all the other nodes. But then as time goes by, like in a small time step where maybe one error has occurred, if I don't do any detection in, or, or anything like that, then that probability is gonna start to smear out to that first column of different states. Uh, and uh, you know, if the errors are happening fast compared to the information rate in my measurements, that probability will continue to smear out in this graph and eventually I'm screwed. But you know, if, your measure, if your information gain rate is fast enough compared to the rate at which errors are occurring, then the conditioning on the measurements that you've received allows you to kind of keep the probability mass localized, mostly at least on one of these uh, error states. Um, and you know, what you're trying to do is sort of uh, construct a model that will do that in an optimal way. Interesting to see is that this business of looking at a random walk, a random walk on a graph uh, based on measurements that come to you in Gaussian noise, uh, the optimal uh, state estimator for such a problem was actually written down in, the, in like around in 1965 by a guy named Wanham. So uh, he, one, the Wanham filter is actually the uh, optimal uh, numerical procedure for doing that in a recursive way where you're trying to do this in real time. And so actually the, the problem of how to do that is something that's solved and we can just, uh, we can take that for granted. <coughs> and so if you start to do some simulations of that sort of process, so here what we're doing is we take a, a three qubit code, initialize it in some logical state, and then we simulate in a continuous time sort of way both bit flips that might be acting on the qubits of the code, and we're also simulating these continuous noisy measurements of a pair of parities. And so what's uh, drawn in the simulation plot at the top is uh, initially we start out with a probability value of one assigned to IAI, and then we're just gonna look at the probability values, the posterior probabilities, that are assigned to the single error state function of time. So up on the top there, time is on the horizontal axis. You'll see that there's a black trace that starts out at one and then the red, blue, and green traces start out at zero. As time goes on, we have uh, some kind of wiggly features. At that horizontal green dashed line, there in this particular simulation, a bit flip actually occurs on the first qubit. So the actual state of the code goes to XII. But then the uh, posterior reconstructions of that state as determined by the Wannum filtering equations are shown, uh, they have a little bit of, a, of latency, right? So because of the fact that you have finite uh, information rate coming out of your measurements, it takes a little bit of time to notice that that bit flip has actually occurred. But eventually, in fact, the green probability does go up close to one and the other ones come back down close to zero. Uh, so that's one feature of this sort of system. And then you also notice that actually even before that bit flip occurs, there's this funny little hiccup at about 4.3 
right, where there's a little bit of a glitch where the probability of one goes down and the other ones go up. So generally in these sorts of systems where you don't have instantaneous perfect measure, but rather you have these continuous <coughs> noisy finite rate of information kinds of measurements. There's latency in detecting errors, and there's also some uh, false alarm rate. These are things that you know, people have studied in, in, in control theory forever. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that regardless of how we actually implement the error correction or the error tracking, whether we do that using a classical computer propagating the quantum uh, filtering equations, or whether we do that using a coherent feedback setup of the type that I'm about to describe, we should imagine that because of the finite rate of information gained in the parity measurements, Right? There always will be these non-idealities. And eventually those things will catch up with you. Right? So eventually the fact that you have latency and the fact that there's a finite rate of false alarms just due to you know, like anomalous sequences of the random measurement results, uh, you know, the, your, your fidelity will decay in, in an irreversible fashion. But kind of the better your code is, or the better your, uh, your memory is, the more you will slow down the actual um, uh, decay of fidelity as compared to the situation where you don't encode your involved. Okay, uh, so there's just a, a little primer on continuous syndrome detection. Uh, next I'll move on to talking a little bit about uh, the ideas of coherent feedback and how you might use this kind of a probing setup to actually diagnose and <coughs> diagnose the syndrome and to try to correct the errors without ever actually sticking a photo detector in your setup and without bringing these uh, signals necessarily back up to a, a kind of macroscopic uh, controller. So uh, this is just uh, starts to make some interesting connections between the whole business of quantum error correction and uh, kind of a major theme in quantum control theory uh, that's developed over the past few years. And so uh, I think by now many people will recognize the kind of setup that's drawn on the right-hand side of the slide where we have some quantum mechanical input-output system, which is the system we're trying to control. In the control theoretic jargon, you usually call that the plant. And so for many years, people have been considering situations where some probe beam goes into the plant, maybe it's a laser probe. So the laser scatters off of the, uh, the things inside the plant, their states become correlated. Laser beam comes out of the plant, you send it to a photo detector, right? So that uh, destroys the outgoing probe beam. You convert those entanglements into classical correlations between the information in your electrical signal and what's going on with the conditional state of the plant. Based on that information, you've got some kind of a classical circuit or a computer which tries to extract updates about what's going on with the plant dynamics, possibly with uh, perturbation dynamics, and the classical controller makes some decision about ways to uh, uh, act back on the plant to try to correct the way that it's evolving, and typically those corrections are done by either altering the way that laser beams are going into the plant, or maybe you modulate other things like magnetic fields or electric fields or what have you. But so that, that's a picture that uh, now we would call measurement feedback control. Right, so it's really real-time feedback control in the sense that within the coherence time of the plant dynamics, we're trying to execute many such loops of detection and feedback, um, but real-time, but it's measurement-based in the sense that when quantum fields come out of the plant, we detect them and then really only propagate classical information for a while and then uh, do something that acts back on the plant. So in a certain sense, you could maybe just say that the feedback loop itself has zero quantum capacity by construction. Um, on the other hand, uh, one can obviously think about a situation uh, more like what's on the left. Uh, this is what we'll now call coherent feedback quantum control. It's not a new idea. You can find uh, very interesting papers on this kind of thing in the electrical engineering and quantum optics literature going back into the 80s at least. Uh, but so here you have the same sort of situation where there's a plant, which is the thing that you're trying to control. Some laser beam goes into the plant, scatters, becomes correlated. But now when that laser beam comes out, rather than detecting it, you now route that output laser beam through another physical system, which kind of processes that information in a coherent sort of way, and then that uh, laser beam loops back and gets re-injected into the plant. So you end up closing a control loop, which is uh, fully coherent, in the sense that we never assume that there's any measurement going on, at least not necessarily so. From an experimental point of view, really what this is, is you're just making some kind of a giant interferometer. But uh, I think what's been interesting in the control theory literature recently is that if you were going to think about designing large controllers like this, where there's a uh, one piece of the interferometer uh, which is given, and you're trying to design the other piece of the interferometer so that you control the dynamics of the first part in some desirable way, that's now the business of uh, coherent feedback control synthesis. And so there's been some interesting work to relate that kind of design problem uh, to methodologies that are already known in, in the context of control theory. And you know, from a, a very fundamental point of view, what's interesting about that maybe is that now you can have situations where the quantum capacity of the feedback loop is non-zero. I think it's interesting to ask how that changes the game. Uh, I will note ahead of time that in the coherent feedback controller, 
that I'm going to show you for the uh, error correction codes, we don't use that quantum capacity, but it's maybe an interesting future of uh, how could, you know, would there be any advantage to actually trying to design uh, a quantum memory where you, where you did uh, take advantage of that. And so some of you may recognize that this kind of uh, idea of using one quantum system to control another quantum system, uh, there's a different way of formulating this that Seth Lloyd and some others have looked at. Um, I think the main distinction is that where there, they tend to just sort of take a system, split it into two parts, and ask about designing the interaction Hamiltonian. This is a little bit of a different uh, story because we're really assuming that all of the uh, interactions between the client and the controller are mediated by propagating electromagnetic fields. And so it actually makes for a much more experimentally friendly and a more engineering friendly kind of uh, design paradigm, which is much closer to the kinds of things that we're used to dealing with in electrical engineering. Right, so we don't assume that there are any direct Hamiltonian interactions between the controller system and the plant system. Rather, the only thing that's really happening is this kind of funny loop scattering involving coherent uh, optical or, or maybe even microwave fields. Um, so here's a, a schematic example of, uh, of what we would call a, a continuous uh, bit flip quantum error correction system. And so this kind of schematic is meant to be completely analogous to the simple op amp with the two resistor uh, <coughs> network that was uh, shown on one of the introductory slides. So the items that are actually on this diagram, so there's a Q1, Q2, Q3. So those are meant to be the three qubits of, your, uh, of the register. Uh, so the logical state in the memory is encoded in an entangled state of those three qubits. Um, as I had earlier mentioned, we assume that each one of those qubits is coupled locally to its own optical cavity. And that cavity is there in order to enable this kind of uh, scattering readout of the parity. Now, in addition to those three qubit cavities that form the register, uh, we're also going to have two devices of, uh, of a kind that we call a relay. And I'll show you a, a kind of a zoom in or push down into what that looks like in just a second. But then all of these things are really kind of cavity QED based devices. So they have very defined optical input and output ports. And what the red and blue lines show you is merely how those input output ports are supposed to be connected. Right, so the idea is that if you're a, a you know, brilliant advanced nanophotonics engineer and you understand the basic principles of the cavity QED that goes into the design of each one of these components, then it's fairly simple for you to translate this cartoony diagram into an actual schematic for the devices that you would fabricate by uh, you know, lithographically patterning some very thin dielectric wafer. Maybe you then have to do some fancy things about implanting quantum dots or, or other sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, impurities like that. But if you could make that sort of thing, Right, where the connections among the components are, are realized just by fixed waveguides that you've fabricated into this chip. Right, the claim is that once you make such a thing, in order to kind of get this thing to go and do continuous quantum error correction, the only thing that you have to add is you have to power it. Right? And so in this case, what that means is that there are three input ports, which really you could draw as two. So there's a blue input port all the way, and you're just supposed to inject laser power at a given wavelength into that port. And then these two other red input ports marked beta, obviously those could come out of a beam splitter from a single red input port, but that's a place where you're supposed to inject a different wavelength laser beam. And so in order for this thing to work, there's a certain parameter hierarchy that should be respected. So alpha should not be much larger than beta, and beta and alpha should fit in between some other parameters of what actually gets built in the circuit. But a very important thing about this is that you don't have to fine tune their values at all. Right, so the overall error correction circuit will work for a very wide range of, of those actual parameter values. And also, uh, they don't have to be perfectly constant in time. You don't have to clock them. You certainly don't need to, to make them conditional on any signals that are coming out of the device. You really just have to put power in from, from two lasers. Right, so <coughs> in that regard, we feel like we get a lot closer to the kind of familiar situation from electrical engineering where you've just got plus and minus VCC. You just hook up a power supply and the thing goes. And so that's really the, the ideal that we're trying to do so it's in this sort of a design of, a, of an autonomous quantum memory. <coughs> so in order to show you uh, finally how we really wrap all of that stuff up into an overall model of how the circuit uh, works, um, the, the essential idea of it is that once you have uh, defined input-output models for each one of those different components, then we can sort of abstract it to where, say, uh, you know, these uh, boxes that are marked B1, uh, B3, B5, those are beam splitter devices. Every beam splitter has, uh, if we just think about unidirectional flow, it has two input ports and two output ports. Those are represented by the left and right circles. Likewise, the devices that I've called relays have four inputs and four outputs, and those are shown right there. 
the cubic cavities end up having both the scattering input output ports that are for the parity measurement, and there are also feedback ports to drive Raman transition to the atoms. Those are also drawn there. But sort of once you have those individual components, then what you would like to do is build an overall model for the circuit where we consider the interconnections of, say, you, know, the, you take the, one of the outputs of this beam splitter and you route it into some specific input in one of the qubit components. So once you specify that connection topology, we use this uh, so-called uh, circuit algebra, quantum circuit algebra, uh, most recently uh, detailed by uh, John Gubb and Matthew James, <coughs> where you can take those individual components, which are mathematically represented in a certain way uh, by these symbols B1, Q21, Q13, and then we, uh, the connections are, sp this, the serial connections are specified by these little triangles. Um, these box plus symbols indicate something which is kind of like a tensor product thing. Right, but we now have a, a way of understanding how these input output models need to be connected in order to construct an overall circuit model. And so that's something that we can now do in a relatively straightforward way using developments in quantum optics circuit theory, uh, which have really uh, uh, over the past few years. So as for those individual components, we've, also, we've already talked about uh, how to model the parity measurement by this cavity QED scattering kind of setup uh, that's drawn in the upper left-hand corner. <coughs> Feedback operations onto the individual atomic qubits can be uh, implemented by Raman transitions. So uh, G and H here are like the, uh, the logical states for the uh, atoms inside, the, inside the, 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 the register qubit atoms. If we want to flip the state of that, we can do that by closing an optical Raman transition. And those Raman transitions are things where they only get, if they're sufficiently detuned from a virtual excited state, then those Raman transitions are only driven if uh, both of those different probe beams that are drawn by the red arrows, if they're both present at the same time. And so that gives us a, a, a kind of an anding uh, capability that uh, one needs in order to turn the syndromes into a specification of which qubits are actually supposed to be flipped. And then the uh, relay is a somewhat complicated kind of thing. It, it again involves an atom-like uh, emitter or impurity. It's now supposed to be coupled to three distinct cavity modes. But again, you can write down the kind of microscopic description of what that thing is uh, in terms of a, a cavity QED model. Uh, and you can simulate it at that microscopic level and verify that it uh, works reasonably well in accessible parameter regimes. But what's uh, perhaps more important for really describing this overall circuit and doing simulations or master equation integrations of the circuit, now if you think about it here, if we've got three cavity modes and you end up needing a four level uh, atom description in order to get the microscopic model of the relay, then you know, you're probably talking about a thousand Hilbert space dimensions to really do that uh, you know, sort of in, in the familiar sort of way. But what's been very nice is that we can make use of a, a, a limit theorem that was recently derived by uh, Bouton, Van Handen, Van, Bouton, Van Handel, and Silberfarb, uh, such that in this small volume limit that I've talked about a couple of times already, which is the natural one for na nanophotonics, and where you assume that G and kappa for the cavities both get large at the same time, that that thousand dimensional-ish kind of uh, microscopic model for each relay limits to a very simple model that has a two-dimensional internal cu uh, qubit space, and where the ways that external fields interact with that internal state can all be specified by a scattering matrix type thing, uh, which is like the usual sort of scattering matrix, except the matrix elements are operators. Right? So these are projectors onto the G and H states of the relay, and these are operators that swap the state of the relay. So having done that, the relays can now be replaced by two-dimensional sorts of models rather than thousand-dimensional sorts of models, and it becomes reasonable to imagine that in building up a circuit model for something like this, we've got two dimensions for each of the cubic cavities, and we've got two dimensions for each of the relays. And so this is now something whose overall dimension is small enough that we can actually do explicit integrations of the thing. We can actually look at the master equation and tell what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, we can have some confidence that that's a limit model that really controls the behavior of a true microscopic physical model for such a thing in the frame where G and kappa are both large. So that's been a, a very important kind of uh, modeling and analysis tool that we've uh, brought along in, in conjunction with doing this work on, on quantum error correcting codes. <coughs> so at the end of the day, uh, if we now apply all this fancy limit theorem stuff and apply the quantum circuit algebra, what it will spit out for you at the end of the day is an actual master equation uh, for the evolution of this autonomous um, uh, uh, quantum memory. And so what you'll note in it is that uh, here's the specification. So the overall form is the usual sort of master equation, the top left-hand equation. Rho t, that's the density matrix as a function of time. That's the density matrix jointly on the internal states of the three qubits in the register and of the two relays. It's got the usual Lindblad form. So there's a Hamiltonian h. There's a set of Lindblad operators 
uh, of which I've here written four, and the other three are simply the uh, bit flips that act randomly on the three register qubits. Uh, and uh, let's see, so let's actually first look at what the jump operators are. So L1, if we look at this thing, what does that look like? So we've got one plus Z1, Z2, right? So Z1 and Z2, those are the, the Pauli Z uh, observables for the first and second qubits. Their product is the qubit one, qubit two parity. So when the qubit one, qubit two parity is even, then that thing takes value one. And so one plus one is two, so that term is operative. And so the operator that multiplies that is sigma HG of relay one. Right, so that says that when the parity of qubits one and two is even, there's a kind of a decay term which tries to decay the state of relay one from the G state into the H state. On the other hand, in L2, we've got the opposite sort of thing where since this is one minus Z1, Z2, what that term does is that when the parity of qubits one and two is odd, there's a term that tries to decay the state of relay one from H into G, right? So it really, it try, there's a decay term that tries to force the state of the relay into something that logically reflects uh, the parity of a pair of qubits, and you've got the complementary thing going on in L3 and L4 for qubits two and three and the state of relay two. If we then go back and look and see what's happening in the Hamiltonian, we find that there are terms like projector onto G of relay one times projector onto H of relay two times X1. So that term in the Hamiltonian says, uh, I'm gonna induce a Rabi oscillation to bit flip qubit one if and only if the states of relay one and two are G and H respectively. Second term, we'll try to flip qubit three if the two relay states are H and G. And the last term tries to flip the state of qubit two if the relay states are G and G. And obviously if the states of the relays are H and H, then there's no feedback applied. Right, so the overall logic of decoding the syndrome table to determine which one of the qubits is supposed to be corrected, that's, that's just directly written into what's going on in the Hamiltonian. And sort of the action of the probe beams in terms of now driving the relays to correctly diagnose the syndrome uh, that's somehow encapsulated in these uh, Lindblad type operators that are giving you a sort of decay. And uh, you know, this, when this, this really, so th these equations popped out of a kind of 20 page set of calculations that start from really microscopic models of the cavity QED dynamics of all of the components that we're designing into the circuit model. But after applying these limit theorems, uh, this is the thing that just pops out on its own as the dynamics of the, of the quantum error correction circuit in the small volume limit. And it was very nice to see this whole thing come out in this very uh, uh, sort of easily interpretable kind of way. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I'm sure, I, I know that other people have looked at uh, writing down master equations mm -hmm. to correspond to something like a uh, quantum error correction. But I, this is, at least as far as we know, the first example of actually microscopically deriving one starting from a completely uh, specified and reasonable underlying uh, physical uh, component model. Now, one thing that I think is kind of cute about this is that, you know, since I mean, we have these things where there are a lot of the terms that are kind of like decay terms. You know, it points out that, um, you know, in classical control theory, you get used to the idea that you use real-time feedback for distinct kinds of purposes. So one reason why you use real-time feedback is to accomplish disturbance attenuation. So if there's some disturbances acting on your plant and you want to suppress those, real-time feedback is the only really powerful way to do that uh, when you're in this kind of Markov limit for, for, for the dynamics of the plant versus the, the correlations of your, of your disturbances. But the other reason why you use real-time feedback is that by doing so, you can actually uh, tailor the effective dynamics of your plant. So a classic example of that is if you have something which is a nonlinear oscillator, right? So it's x squared plus x to the fourth, something like that. But if you have a measurement of x as a real function of time, and you can act back on it with an arbitrary force, well, ob obviously, if you act back on it with a force that looks like negative your measurement to the fourth power, you can try to cancel out that nonlinear non part of the, uh, of the um, oscillation. Right. So real-time feedback is also used to synthesize dynamics in a certain way. And so what you get here is a funny kind of, I, I would like to, um, we would like to sort of take some time to look at this, but kind of what you've done by, by these, uh, of, these, um, of these scattering loops, right? I mean, we don't have any direct physical interactions between any of the degrees of freedom that are here, right? So the register qubits don't directly interact with each other. They don't directly interact with the relay states. All of those interactions are really carried by this field. But at least when we go over into this uh, strong uh, parameter limit, you find that the overall equations of motion have a kind of a ferromagnetic sort of flavor to them, right? And that you have decay terms that are really trying to keep uh, the states of the relays and the registers as correlated as possible. And they're even decay-ish types of terms. So really somehow what you're doing in all of this, and maybe this is just a feature of the bit flip error correction code, you're sort of synthesizing a ferromagnetic interaction and then trying to get the thing to stay cool. And uh, you know, using coherent feedback is a way to do that where those interactions actually get synthesized at the Lindblad and, and Hamiltonian operator kind of level.
Okay, so just in the last uh, couple of uh, minutes, let me just mention that, okay, so having written down this overall master equation, you can do numerical integrate with uh, a range of different parameter values. Here, omega is some single parameter that captures the overall uh, strength of the, of the optical probes uh, that are in the feedback loop. Uh, and you know, as that increases from zero up to higher values, you see that the, the decay of the fidelity of the encoded qubit slows down more and more and more. Um, uh, uh, oh, and so another thing which I think is interesting about this is you note that the, uh, the way that the uh, parities of things and the, uh, and the relay states appear in these Lindblad operators, if you have bit flip operations that were acting on the relay state, those would also get corrected by the coherent feedback. Right, because <coughs> when the parity of qubits one and two is even, uh, you know, it tries to push the relay one state from G to H. Now, if the parities don't change, but some environmental error comes in and accidentally flips the state of the relay, it will try to get pushed back by that same term. So in this feedback, the sort of the qubits correct the relays in the same way that the relays correct the qubits. So that's a nice property of the code, but it's about things like propagation losses. So in these sorts of uh, nanophotonic circuits, if I'm taking light from one of these devices, propagating through a waveguide, and uh, trying to inject it into another, obviously the transmission of light through that isn't gonna be perfect. Um, so one wants to have a model that includes propagation losses. Uh, it is straightforward, but extremely cumbersome to do that. Uh, these are, this is work that's now being done by Gopal Sarma, who's uh, here somewhere in the back, um, of uh, really taking apart the network model, inserting a whole bunch of beam splitters to model the losses, uh, sort of distributed everywhere throughout the circuit. And having done that, one can then go back in, take that uh, composite model that includes the losses, and look at the performance of the bit flip code or say the phase flip code uh, as a function of the increasing uh, loss parameter. And I should say that uh, in this kind of a circuit, uh, so in this circuit layout, um, if you just change some things about the polarization of the light and the way that the logical states are defined for exactly the same kind of atomic level structure, you can implement a phase code instead of a bit flip code if that's what you want to do. <coughs> and that gives you the idea that, well, you really ought to be able to construct a shore-like code. And so, in fact, uh, in, a, in a paper from earlier this year in the New Journal of Physics, we sort of lay out the picture of how you would construct a nine qubit uh, Bacon Shore type code, where the actual implementation that we looked at, the only way that it uses the subsystem structure is that it sort of uses the, the cheap and easy uh, feedback method, where it just sort of corrects some particular qubit in each uh, row and column, rather than going back to the exact ones. Uh, but you can further make use of the subsystem structure by breaking up the measurements and things like that. So uh, I think all of those basic ideas that come up in the usual world of quantum error correction, they, they propagate very easily into this uh, continuous time method. So just as a last comment, you know, this idea of now being able to view quantum error correction as a form of, uh, of coherent feedback control, I, I mentioned on a couple of occasions that coherent feedback control is a, a theme of increasing interest in the quantum control uh, community as a whole. And um, something that we've been particularly interested in is that uh, if you think about the industrial laboratory efforts that are going on <laughs> in places like HP and IBM, you know, they're really plunging ahead, building nanophotonic uh, uh, systems for doing classical information processing. But <clears throat> if you listen to the kinds of uh, performance goals that they have, they're always talking about trying to get into a regime of attajoule switching energies and picosecond switching times. And so what that says to me is attajoules in the optical is a handful of photons. Picosecond is a small time compared to the coherence times of things that we know. And so, like it or not, uh, if those are your goals for your classical information processing, you will have to deal with quantum fluctuations in the optical fields that are propagating through your circuit. And of course, if you want to play any of the usual tricks that people have about sort of taking NAND gates and making them into latches, or all that other sorts of classical logical stuff, if you try to push that onto a photonics implementation in this attajoule pico, picosecond world, you will have to model those things quantum optically or you will not get the classical information processing performance. And so a large part of our group's effort, and this is now the, the DARPA funded thing that I had uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, is on trying to take coherent feedback control theory for quantum optical systems and to recast it as circuit theory for classical nanophotonics. And so a lot of what that has involved is uh, uh, kind of building a, a whole system where we can do schematic capture using graphical symbols and using your mouse to connect the inputs and outputs of these symbols. <coughs> Doing that using uh, common tools like GSCEM, so, so commercially available or, or even open source freeware kinds of schematic capture tools. We can compile that into a sort of a text-based description of what the actual quantum optical circuits are in terms of how the uh, components are interconnected. And then there's a, a, a very large Python code that will go through and compile that and spit out at the end of the, the, end of the day a completely quantum mechanical model. 
And so what we're now trying to do is kind of sort of merge these streams of thought where uh, to, to think about quantum optical circuits for more complex codes with or without propagation losses included. You can do those calculations by hand, but they're already extremely, extremely cumbersome. And so, uh, but you know, any of this methodology that we're building to make quantum optical circuits for classical information processing, they're fully quantum mechanical, they carry all the entanglements and all that. So you can also use them for the quantum information processing. And so, uh, you know, just to finish up, uh, let me emphasize that maybe is the main thing that we, that we like about all this, where by taking quantum error correction, viewing it as a form of coherent feedback control in nanophotonic circuits, it somehow now appears as one end of a continuous spectrum of things that one can do in the world of nanophotonics or maybe circuit QED. And I think that, you know, sort of very simply connects it to the two very large scale industri industrial efforts that are going on. I think maybe helps us see how quantum engineering really is just a kind of perturbative evolution of, of present day uh, electrical engineering. Thanks. Thanks, Leo, for introducing us to this nanophotonic security. Are there any questions? Several. Um, my question may not be well formed, so uh, bear with me. But what I'm wondering is, how does this QEC coherent feedback control depend on this physical system being coherent? So for example, H bar omega being greater than KT, or coherence time is much greater than operation time. I guess what I'm getting at is, um, how far can you extend this idea beyond CAVI QED, perhaps to other physical systems? I mean, I think the general approach is certainly extensible. I mean, really the only, I, the main idea that happens here is that we try to take the logical operations that are usually done in, in decoding the syndrome and determining the feedback, and we try to implement that using parts that are the same parts that we use to make the qubits. We try to do that as simply as possible, and we end up with a model that kind of looks like this. Now, obviously, the qubits that are in your register, those things have not If you actually look at what happens in this sort of operation is that since the feedback in regular quantum error correction is completely classical, right, what you find is that the relay states internally never have to be coherent. Um, and then, you know, the only other place where we really make use of coherence is that uh, the way that the phase shifts in the probeams are read out is essentially by closing interferometers. So these beam splitters that appear right, th right there just on the input to R1, that's sort of an interferometric way of changing the phase shift on the probe beam into routing of the probe power inside one of the inputs of the relay or the other. Right, so the whole thing is in some sense kind of interferometer, so we do rely a little bit on optical coherence. But otherwise, be sort of because the basic ideas of QEC are very classical in terms of the diagnosis and feedback, this circuit itself is not particularly coherent as a coherent feedback circuit. On the other hand, you can ask and say things, uh, I mean, here I'm going way outside my, my, my realm of knowledge, uh, and so this may be a completely stupid assertion, but you could say, you know, if you're going to do all this feedback coherently, you could rely on coherences and entanglements of the relays, and maybe if you did that, you could think about codes where you didn't have to have uh, stabilizer generators that commuted. Uh, I don't know, you know, so maybe there's some room for using this kind of setup to generalize a little bit the way that you think about the design of quantum memories. So uh, at the beginning of your talk, you said there weren't going to be any filter functions. <laughs> uh -oh. But my question is, well, why not? I mean, you, it seems like you have enough tools here to ask the question that you can't usually answer in QEC is, uh, how does this work as the speed of the bit flip errors or the noise that leads to the bit flip errors as, as that s spectral density changes? I, it seems like you could do that analysis pretty uh, you, you could certainly readily do that, for this yeah. circuit. Your only limitation would be in the dimension of the numerical model that you end up with, in that uh, we go to a limit where things are Markovian and uh, you know, effectively in this small volume limit, um, there are lots of things that happen, the, the, the states of the relays change with scattering events. Right, so that limit allows us to get a very numerically compact model, but if you go back to the full model, then you can insert any kind of complex time dynamics you want, and yeah, exactly, look at how the, how the performance degrades as a function of various you know, kernels of, of whatever kind. You would then just be, you would have to deal with a model that was dimensionally much more complicated, but you could certainly do it. In the interest of time, I would yep. rather suggest that we have one question and the short answer. Uh, in figuring out what the right feedback is, you could imagine a, a wide range of, uh, uh, of modeling. I mean, in, in the classical case, up to the point where you actually kind of kept a, a model of the state, exact state of the system at all times and figured out it, the right thing down to just from your instantaneous 
uh, uh, measurement result immediately feeding back something in that's a simple function of that. How much collaboration do you have to do, or how much does simplifying cost you performance? Yeah, so the way that the coherent feedback thing is implemented, the logical processing is kept as simple as possible. So we just do something straightforward. If you take this sort of setup where you imagine that the conditional probabilities on the error state are accessible to the controller and you could do anything that you want, you can use the um, classical framework of uh, stochastic hybrid control to define things like cost functions and you can do optimizations. And that is described a little bit in a 2010 New Journal of Physics paper where what you do is you define a continuation region. So you plot the conditional probabilities of three errors. That's now a point that evolves in a three-dimensional space. You can, you can derive surfaces where when you hit one of those surfaces, that's when you take your control action. And the locations of those surfaces are determined as the function of, of from cost functions that you specify. So th there's room for a lot more complicated kind of stuff. Okay, I'm afraid in the interest of time, we have to close here. Thanks again, Hideo, for a nice talk.